as you point out, really important one. You didn't vote for President Biden or for uncommitted in Minnesota's primary. The uncommitted vote was a big part of the, that primary in your home state. I wonder, uh, if the election were held today, would you vote for Joe Biden? Can you confirm that he would have your vote today? Of course, democracy is on the line. We are facing down fascism. And I personally know what my life felt like mm. having Trump as the president of this country. And I know what it felt like for my constituents and for people around this country and around the world. We have to do everything that we can to make sure that does not happen to our country again. And do you think your constituents ultimately will come to the same conclusion that you did, you know, the tens of thousands who voted uncommitted as a protest against the president? Well, the uncommitted have been very clear. They want a change in policy, and we've seen that. Uh, within three days, you had the vice president using the word ceasefire. Uh, we now have the president saying there is a red line if Israel goes into Rafah that he is going to condition aid. So there has been a significant progress. Mm -hmm. I think it is the responsibility of every citizen of this country that cares for the humanity of all to continue to push this administration to do what it can do uh, to end the onslaught that Palestinians are living through every single day. No, she's a Democrat. They're going to vote for Biden. I'm not surprised about that. I am surprised that in the year of our Lord, 2024, <laughs> there is a public relations agent for Hamas sitting in the United States Congress. Mm -hmm. The reason Israel is not at that meeting is because Hamas will not provide a list of the living hostages. I didn't hear a word, a word of concern for the hostages. You know, ceasefire, she said, don't happen magically. Right. Well, you know, there was a ceasefire in place on October the 6th, mm. and who broke it on October the <clears> 7th? <throat> I cannot believe, honestly, what I heard out of that interview. What I want are for those hostages to come home, and I want somebody, somebody out there, to show just a little bit of remorse that Hamas broke the ceasefire, raped and murdered horrifically women, all kinds of people, Th that's it. How about a little bit of concern for those folks? That's what I'm looking for. I, mean, and I just want to be clear. When I, said, when I said a second ago about not pointing fingers, we all know that Hamas is the one that started this and Hamas is the one that has to come to the table. The question is now, how do we get to a ceasefire? And that means that all the parties in the region are going to have to be present but to make that Ilan happen. Omar there took this opportunity and your very important platform to say that Hamas was the good actor here. Hamas mm. was ready for this meeting. And based on some conspiracy theory, our, um, you know, Jake Sullivan, American uh, representative, is maybe lying about what Israel wants to do and Israel's involvement. Look, I would not go to someone who is a supporter of the BDS movement for their advice on what Israel should do um, or what you, the U.S. should do when it comes to Israel. She's trafficked in anti-Semitic tropes um, that seek to strip Israel and the Jewish people of their sovereignty, their identity. I don't trust her opinion on this issue at all. And listen, there are important voices for the Palestinian people, she's not one of them. Well, I don't know exactly what the president meant, but if he meant by that that I'm pursuing private policies against the majority, the wish of the majority of Israelis, and that this is uh, hurting the interests of Israel, then he's wrong on both counts. Number one, these are not my private policies only. They're policies supported by the overwhelming majority of the Israelis. They support uh, the action that we're taking to destroy the remaining uh, terrorist battalions of Hamas. They say that once we uh, destroy the Hamas, the last thing we should do is put in Gaza, in charge of Gaza, the Palestinian Authority that uh, educates its children towards terrorism and pays for terrorism. And they also support my position that says that we should resoundingly reject the attempt to ram down our throats a Palestinian state. Uh, that is uh, uh, something that they agree on, uh, and it's something that I think is also for the interests of Israel, because uh, the majority of Israelis understand that if we don't do this, what we'll have is a repetition of the October 7th massacre, which is bad for Israel, bad for the Palestinians, bad for the uh, future of peace in the Middle East. So the, the attempt to say that my policies are my private policies that are not supported by most Israelis is false. The vast majority are united as never before, and they understand what's good for Israel. Fourth major obstacle to peace is Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who has all too frequently bowed to the demands of extremists like Ministers Smotrich and Ben Gavir, and the settlers in the West Bank. I have known Prime Minister Netanyahu for a very long time. While we have vehemently disagreed on many occasions, I will always respect his extraordinary bravery for Israel on the battlefield as a younger man. I believe in his heart he has his highest priority is, as is the security of Israel. However, 
I also believe Prime Minister Netanyahu has lost his way by allowing his political survival to take the precedence over the best interests of Israel. He has put himself in coalition with far-right ex far -right extremists like Minister Smotrich and Ben Gavir, and as a result, he has been too willing to tolerate the civilian toll in Gaza, which is pushing support for Israel worldwide to historic lows. Israel cannot survive if it becomes a pariah. Prime Minister Netanyahu has also weakened Israel's political and moral fabric through his attempts to co-opt the judiciary, and he has shown zero interest in doing the courageous and visionary work required to pave the way for peace even before this present conflict. As a lifelong supporter of Israel, it has become clear to me the Netanyahu coalition no longer fits the needs of Israel after October 7th. The world has changed radically since then, and the Israeli people are being stifled right now by a governing vision that is stuck in the past. Nobody expects Prime Minister Netanyahu to do the things that must be done to break the cycle of violence, to preserve Israel's credibility on the world stage, and to work towards a two-state solution. If he were to disavow ministers Smotrich and Ben Gavir and kick them out of his, government co his governing coalition, that would be a real meaningful step forward. But regrettably, there's no reason to believe Prime Minister Netanyahu would do that. He won't disavow ministers Smotrich and Ben Gavir in their calls for Israelis to drive Palestinians out of Gaza and the West Bank. He won't commit to a military operation in Rafah that prioritizes protecting civilian life. He won't engage responsibly in discussions about a day after plan for Gaza and a, long -term, and a longer term pathway to peace. Hamas and the Palestinians who support and tolerate their evil ways, radical right wing Israelis in government and society, President Abbas, Prime Minister Netanyahu. These are the four obstacles to peace. And if we fail to overcome them, then Israel and the West Bank and Gaza will be trapped in the same violent state of affairs they've experienced for the last 75 years. We've had Vice President Harris calling in more forceful terms for a ceasefire. The president announced during the State of the Union that the military would be building a port in Gaza to deliver aid. He has been extremely critical of Netanyahu. He was caught on a hot mic. I'm sure you heard that. Uh, what have you thought of what have been significant rhetorical changes, at least? Uh, has that gone anywhere? <laughs> Certainly, you know, pressure works. You see that there is a difference in tone where there's now a recognition of Palestinian suffering. But what I would tell you is that words are not enough. Um, what we want to see is actual change in policy. We want to see actually holding Benjamin Netanyahu and the most right wing government in Israel's history to account. You know, you heard Senator Schumer's remarks today on the floor demonstrating that pressure works, calling for the distancing and, in fact, the replacing of Benjamin Netanyahu as the prime minister, as well as calling upon President Biden and utilizing our ability and our tool to restrict military funding as a means of trying to find ourselves towards a just solution for the Palestinian people. Well, you mentioned what uh, Senator Schumer said, the Senate Majority Leader, calling for new elections in Israel. Would that make a difference to you? Uh, do you think it would make a difference who leads Israel in the type of war that would be prosecuted? And how much of a difference does that make to you that he specifically is calling for that? You know, we have been sounding the alarm about Benjamin Netanyahu for over two decades, knowing that he is a fascist and a war tyrant and a war criminal. And he has been one of the individuals who gloats about being able to stall peace and prevent the establishment of a Palestinian state. So certainly it makes a difference with who leads uh, the Israeli government. But what's important is that while the elections could be called for, elections can go into process, that doesn't change what's happening on the ground today. This is why it's extremely important for President Biden to utilize the leverage that he currently has and restricting military aid and being forceful. And this calls not for a temporary ceasefire, but a permanent and lasting ceasefire immediately. Those are the things that we're looking for from our president because that can make the difference today. Each morning we wake up uh, and what we find is a kill count. How many innocent men, women, and children had been killed by the Israeli government, by the IDF, utilizing American manufactured weapons? And we need to halt that immediately. And of course, we're watching starvation as well happen. And there's a lot of uh, groups who are sounding the alarm about what should be coming here in the coming weeks. We've just started to see this and it's expected to balloon if the aid doesn't increase dramatically.